Welcome to the Savannah Book Festival. My name is Stan Thornton. I'm session moderator for this session, final session of the day for the Savannah Book Festival 16th annual event. We appreciate the attendance of all of you. This year the festival is presented by the following. The Philip E. and Nancy B. Beekman Foundation David and Nancy Centron, Robert Faircloth, the Courtney Knight Gaines Foundation, the Gerald D. and Helen M. Stevens Foundation, with a special thank you to a grant from Georgia Humanities. We're especially grateful to the Lemon Foundation for sponsoring this event at the First Baptist Church Sanctuary. It's a beautiful venue and one of the most beautiful, in my opinion, of the entire book festival, and we're happy to have you here. The venue is offered in honor of Carol and Joe Young, and we thank them for that. I would also like to welcome all of you generous sponsors and literati members. Uh, if there are any sponsors and literati members here, if just show a wavy hand, I'd like to see it, and others might as well got a good turnout we appreciate it glad to have you here and thank you for your support through the support of people like you we're able to make all the festival events on festival saturday free and open to the public and that's a matter of great pride to everybody in the savannah book festival community fully 90 percent of the revenue for the savannah book festival comes from donors literati members and attendees like you and for all of your contributions, we thank you. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping notes. My guess is you've already heard it more than once, but it's important to the people who organize the Savannah Book Festival to make sure we're all aware of the procedures that are followed. So if you're coming to the first event or seventh event if you've heard it but we think it's important to repeat it each time our author Danny Shapiro is already here on the front row she's been speaking to a lot of people she'll be signing her book festival purchased copies of her book in Tell Fair Square it's very near here if there are anyone here who doesn't know how to get there to purchase her book or other books that are on sale today uh, please ask one of the ushers and they'd be happy to tell you it's less than two blocks south of here and hope you'll attend and, and visit Danny and uh, get her autographed copy of her book please take this moment to ensure that your cell phone is turned off that would be very important to you very embarrassing to you if you don't. Uh, we request that if you're, you are allowed to take photographs, but please don't use flash photography. It's uh, distracting to the author and to any others that are here as well. On the back of the program, you'll find a QR code for a survey. Please take a moment to complete it to share your opinion about your attendance at the book festival this year. The people in the book festival feel that's a very important part of what we do. Uh, the survey helps annually from to plan from year to year. And those of you that have attended for a while, especially some of the authors have mentioned it, it gets more and more organized every year. And uh, we appreciate the people that work at the book festival for trying to improve it every year making it better for all of us it's also extremely important in this survey that we have it for use in discussions with the city of savannah and concerning their support of our mission and their cooperation with us they look at attendance they look at whether people come from out of town and how many come from out of town. 
to look at what your impression is about the book festival and what it does for the city of Savannah. So if you'd fill out that survey, it would be a great benefit to those who do the planning for the Savannah Book Festival. <clears throat> I'll mention one other thing about contributions. As you leave, you will have an opportunity to donate. The ushers will have yellow buckets. They've been in every venue, so you're probably familiar with them. I would encourage you to make a donation if you would. That cash donation is not convenient. We've arranged for you to donate through Venmo using the QR code that's also on your program. That is not convenient. You can go to the Savannah Book Festival website. It's easy to find, and once you get there, it's easy to make a donation, and we encourage you to do so. Lastly, the author has agreed and is part of our general format to have a question and answer session. She's going to leave about 20 minutes at the end uh, because she says she likes questions and answers. So those who like to ask questions and receive answers, Danny is going to do that for you. We've got two ushers with microphones that are going to be roaming the sanctuary. We encourage you to wait Raise your hand, and we'll direct the microphone, two microphone people to you. Uh, <clears throat> we've had situations in before. The microphone's down here, and the question's back there. Somebody's excited, and they want to ask a question. They jump up and blurt out a question. A lot of times, nobody hears about the author, and the author starts answering. Nobody in the audience knows what's going on. It'll help us both if you... Please ask questions. Danny encourages them. And then wait for the people with a microphone to come and then state your question and everybody will hear it and understand it. And then Danny's agreed to answer them all. So we have until, we have 55 minutes for the total program. So please be ready with your questions. Danny is with us today as a courtesy of Jeannie and Jay Aarons, as well as Mary and Lynn Harvey. I know Jeannie is here. Glad to have her. Any of the others? Well, thank you. We appreciate it. Danny's a best selling novelist and memorist and host of the podcast Family Secrets, now in its seventh season. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Vogue, and time. She has taught at Columbia and New York University and is the co-founder of the Siren Land Writers Conference. She lives in Litchfield County, Connecticut. Please help me give her a warm welcome for her visit here in Savannah and her presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you in Savannah. And um, Jeannie, I want to thank you for sponsoring my event. And it's really a treat to be at this really very beautiful, special uh, book festival. I'm going to read just a very little bit from the opening of my recent novel, Signal Fires, just to give you a taste of it. And then I want to talk about the role of secrets um, in my life um, that led to, I suppose, what you could call the prevailing theme in my work over the course of 11 books um, and, and why that has come to be and how, it, and how it's culminated in many ways in, in this novel. So this is the very opening of Signal Fires, August 27th, 1985. Sarah and Theo. And it's nothing really, or might be nothing, or ought to be nothing, as he leans his head forward to press the tip of his cigarette to the car's lighter. It sizzles on contact, a sound particular to its brief moment in history in which cars have lighters 
and otherwise sensible 15-year-olds choke down Marlboro Reds and drive their mother to Buicks without so much as a learner's permit. There's a girl he wants to impress. Her name is Misty Zimmerman, and if she lives through this night, she will grow up to be a magazine editor, or a high school teacher, or a defense lawyer. She will become a mother of three, or remain childless. She will die young of ovarian cancer, or live to know her great-grandchildren. But these are only a few possible arcs to a life, a handful of shooting stars in the night sky. Change one thing, and everything changes. A tremor here sets off an earthquake there, a fault line deepens, a wire gets tripped, his foot on the gas. He doesn't really know what he's doing, but that won't stop him. He's all jacked up, just like a 15-year-old boy. He has something to prove, to himself, to Misty, to his sister. It's as if he's following a script written in Braille, his fingers running across code he doesn't understand. Theo, slow down. That's his sister Sarah from the back seat. Misty is riding shotgun. It was Sarah who tossed him the keys to their mother's car. Sarah, age 17. After this night, she will become unknowable to him. The summer sky is a veil thrown over the moon and stars. The streets are quiet. The good people of Avalon long since tucked in for the night. Their own parents are asleep in their queen-size bed under the plaid afghan knitted by one of their father's patients. His mom is a deep sleeper, but his dad has been trained by a lifetime as a doctor to bolt awake at the slightest provocation. He is always ready. The teenagers aren't looking for trouble. They're good kids, everyone would say so, but they're bored. It's the end of summer, school will resume next week. Sarah's going into her senior year after which she'll be gone. She's a superstar, his sister. Varsity this, honors that, bristling with potential. Theo has three years left and he's barely made a mark. He's a chubby kid whose default is silence and shame. He blushes easily. He can feel his cheeks redden as he holds the lighter and inhales, hears the sizzle, draws smoke deep into his lungs. His father, a pulmonary surgeon, would kill him. Maybe that's why Sarah threw him the keys. Maybe she's trying to help, get him to act, goddammit, to take a risk. Better to be bad than to be nothing. Misty Zimmerman is just a girl along for the ride. It was Sarah who asked her to come. Sarah doing for Theo what Theo cannot do for himself. Change one thing and everything changes. The Buick speeds down Poplar Street. Misty stretches and yawns in the passenger seat. Theo turns left, then right. He's getting the hang of this. He flicks the directional, then heads onto the parkway. As they pass the mall, he looks to see if Burger King is still open. Watch it, Sarah yells. He swerves back into his lane, heart racing. He almost hit the guardrail. He gets off the parkway at the next exit and eases up on the gas. This was maybe a bad idea. He wants to go home. He also wants another cigarette. Pull over, Sarah says, I'll drive. Theo looks for a good spot to stop. He has no idea how to park. Sarah's right, this is stupid. Actually, no, forget it, I shouldn't, she says. They're almost home. It's like a song in his head. Almost home, almost home, almost home. Just a few blocks to go, they pass the Heller's house, the Chertoffs. As he leans forward, the lighter slips through Theo's fingers and drops into his open shirt collar. He lets out a yelp and tries to grab it, which only makes matters worse. He arches his back to shake the burning metal thing loose, but it's wedged between his shorts and his belly. The smell of singed flesh. A perfect, shiny half moon will remain. Years from now, when a lover traces the scar on his stomach and asks how he got it, he will roll away. But now, now their futures shoot like gamma rays from the moving car. Three high school students. What if Sarah had gone out with her friends instead that night? What if Misty had begged off? What if Theo had succumbed to his usual way of being 
and fixed himself a salami sandwich with lots of mustard and taken it with him to bed. The wheel spins, the screams of children, of teenagers in the night. Theo, no, stop, God. And there is no screech of brakes, nothing to blunt the impact. A concussion of metal and an ancient oak, the sound of two worlds colliding. The fender and right side of the Buick crumple like it's a toy car, and this is all make-believe. Upstairs, on the second floor of Benjamin and Mimi Wilf's home, a light blinks on. A window opens. Ben Wilf stares down at the scene below for a fraction of a second. By the time he's made it to the front door, his daughter Sarah is standing before him. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Her t-shirt and her face splattered with blood. Theo is on all fours on the ground. He seems to be in one piece. Thank God, thank God, thank God. But then, there's a girl in the car, Dad. I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. There's just a little bit more in that opening prologue. The opening of Signal Fires, um, which is meant to be as intense as it felt, um, results in the Wilf family keeping a secret. Um, Misty Zimmerman uh, does not make it out of that car alive. Sarah takes responsibility for the accident and lies and says she was driving and takes a fall for her brother. Uh, and Ben, their father, um, makes, makes what is a parental choice perhaps rather than a physician's choice. And though it might not have changed anything, he has to live for the rest of his life knowing that he would have done anything to protect his children. Um, and that even something that would um, trump his medical judgment. And so the Wilf family and the entire book um, spins out from this moment not in, a, not in a chronological time. It moves around through the decades um, really with a sense of aftermath, the aftermath of a decision, the aftermath of a choice, the aftermath of keeping a secret. The Wilf family does not only keep this secret in the outside world, it never speaks of what happened that night ever again. They don't speak of it to each other. And so the corrosive power of that secret, of the unsaid, of the shameful, um, becomes like the, deep, the deepest kind of silence and it impacts each one of their lives over the course of decades as we watch them um, become adults, grow older. Um, and one of the things that is very clear to me now at this point, 11 years into my, 11 books into my writing life, many years into my writing life, is that from the very beginning, I was writing about secrets. I wrote about them in my first novels, in my first memoir, Slow Motion. I moved from fiction to memoir in a way that was very surprising to me. Why was I suddenly feeling this need to excavate and excavate and dig and dig and inquire and in inquire using my own life, the material of my own life for that inquiry. I knew that that was my subject. I could have told you that family secrets and the power that they hold in families um, was a big part of my thematic material as a writer. But one of the things that I've learned is as a writer, theme is just a fancy literary term for obsession. And we don't choose what obsesses us. And writers don't choose our themes. They, they choose us. And so here, here this was. I couldn't really have answered why if you had asked me any number of years ago. Um, I could have given you reasons and they all would have made sense, but not complete sense. And then as some of you may know, um, about seven years ago, I discovered that I was the family secret in my family. Um, just show of hands, I'm just curious. How many, how many people here have ever taken a home DNA test? Yeah, it's a lot. It's, uh, it's a lot. It's funny because a number of years ago when I started asking that question, fewer hands went up, but it's, it's the most popular 
Christmas gift in America. Um, families give it to each other, you know, just, just for fun. Um, in my case, my husband was sending away for a DNA test and he asked me if I wanted to as well. And I so easily could have said no. I was not interested at all. I knew everything that there was to know about my family history. Um, I grew up the only child of older parents. Uh, my parents were Orthodox Jews. Um, both of them are Eastern European Ashkenazi descent. I knew a great deal in particular about my father's side of the family. Uh, they were real storytellers and had a very storied family history. Um, in my home, I had portraits on the walls of ancestors, uh, mostly from my father's side. He died when I was in my early 20s in a car accident um, in which my mother was also badly injured. And by the time I sent away for that DNA test, my mother had also passed away. It had been gone a number of years. My results came back from that test. I had forgotten I had even taken it. It was of absolutely no significance to me. And when they came back, they revealed that I was about 50% Eastern European Ashkenazi. And the rest was um, a smattering of Western Europe, French, English, Irish, Swedish, German. None of it made any sense to me. I actually just thought maybe these companies just get it wrong sometimes. Um, but long story short, what I was able to discover actually very rapidly was that my father had not been my biological father. Um, that my parents had experienced infertility and had gone to an institute uh, in the early 1960s in order to be able to have their own family and that my biological father must have been a, a sperm donor. I found this out in the middle of my life, having spent all of my life up, to, up until that point absolutely certain of my history, of my paternity, of my maternity, um, of my identity, despite the fact that, in retrospect, I should have known. Um, people told me every single day of my life that I didn't look like anyone in my family, um, that I didn't look Jewish. Um, they insisted upon it. I heard it every day to the point where I would count the number of times I would hear it in any given day. And that propelled me on this journey to find out everything that I could um, in, a, in a world in which both of my parents were gone. They had taken a secret to the grave with them, very much in the way that people did at that time. They were told, never tell a soul that you made your family this way, never tell your own parents, never tell your siblings, the child will never know. It was an entire universe cloaked in secrecy. And so, and I, I wrote um, my last book, which was a memoir about the experience, um, the title of which is Inheritance. And one of the things that became abundantly clear to me in the shock and sort of destabilization of that discovery was that secrets had really formed me when, you know, if you think about it, and most of us never really have a reason to think about it, our identities are formed by the stories that we're told when we're very young. They're formed by the stories that we're told when we're children. Whatever the story might, might be, it's your story. Um, in my case, the story that I was told was in fact not true. And so my identity was formed by something that was absent and missing. And so for most of my childhood and my teenage years and even into my young adulthood, there was this feeling that I had that I didn't completely make sense. It was a, I could have, I could have expressed that to you. I knew that, that something didn't add up, but I didn't know what it was. And I truly believe that that feeling, that gap, into that gap is where most of my work as a writer has gone, trying to piece together the world, trying to piece together what secrets do to us, trying to piece together who my father was, 
you know, why he was sad, why he was, there was something about him that was kind of checked out and already in the rear view mirror by the time I was growing up. Um, why my parents were in a tremendous amount of conflict with each other all the time, largely about me and how to raise me. My father was deeply religious and wanted to raise, raise me as a religious Jew. And my mother, though Jewish, was not religious and was not in fact a believer. And by the way, it's so interesting to know that I'm standing at a podium. <laughs> I love finding myself in places, in unexpected places. Um, half of me belongs here, apparently. Um, but that so completely haunted my work always. Each of my novels centered around the story of a family secret, and I always felt like I wasn't quite getting at it. And then there it was, and it was as if I had been walking around with the wrong prescription glasses all my life, and somebody handed me the perfect prescription, and suddenly I knew, I understood, and it made profound sense. So to go back to signal fires, I started this novel about 15 years ago. I had written several novels, a memoir, two more novels, another memoir, and th these characters appeared to me. The ones that I just read a little bit to you about. The Wilf family, another family across the street named the Shankmans. They appeared to me whole and complete and I began to write what in fact, for those of you who have read Signal Fires already, is the first two sections of the book, about the first hundred pages. I wrote them 15 years ago, and then I lost my way. And I lost my way because I was trying to tell the story backward in time. I was committed to a structure that was completely flawed. There's a reason why m most of you have never read a novel that's told completely backward in time, which is that it's just about impossible, because you run out of runway. So when I reached a point where my favorite character was literally being born in, on New Year's Eve of 1999, I realized that if I kept on moving backward in time, he would no longer be able to be a character unless I got completely metaphysical, which I had no intention of doing. So I had written myself into a corner and in despair and a lot of sadness, I put the pages away and they went into a drawer. And I continued writing. I wrote a book about writing called Still Writing. Um, I was working on my memoir, Hourglass, when I made this discovery in 2016 about my dad. And then I wrote Inheritance, which was like a freight train, you know, just kind of chugging right through the center of everything that I had ever written. It all led to that book. And then when I finished Inheritance, and it sort of exploded, and I went on the road and I was on tour for about a year, people would ask me, what's next? And it was my least favorite question. It's every writer's least favorite question, by the way. Um, but in, in the case of Inheritance, it felt to me like, I don't know. I think I'm finished with a body of work. I think my memoirs could all be a boxed set that you could read in any order. And essentially, they, they would be a study in um, what the writer, me, knew at that point in time. People always ask me which orders that they, they should read my memoirs in, and I don't actually have an opinion. You could read it front to ba back, back to front, you could mix it up. It's because really all we can ever know in life is what we know now. And books represent what a writer knows at a particular moment. I just ended up knowing a whole lot more than I ever had bargained for. But so I really didn't know what was next. And then the pandemic hit. And starting in mid-March of 2020, I, like um, most of us, was in lockdown with my family. And at a certain point, and having trouble, having trouble writing. Most writers at the start of the pandemic were having trouble writing because it really felt like what, what is there to possibly contribute right now as an artist. And then I got tired of wallowing in that. And then I got tired of baking a lot of sourdough bread. And so then one day, 
I was cleaning out my office closet, just Marie Kondoing my office closet. And in my office closet, there was a neat pile of pages, and it was 100 pages of this novel. And I don't know what possessed me. I'm very thankful for it. But a little voice in my head said, reread these. Just reread these now. And I sat down on the floor of my office, and I reread those first 100 pages, which did not include what I just read you. What I just read you, that prologue, I wrote later. I, wrote, I read those first 100 pages, and my mind sort of, I just had such a lightning bolt moment because the first section of this book takes place on one night in 2010. And the next section of the book takes place on one night on New Year's Eve of 1999 going into the year 2000. So I had written two chunks of the book that t took place 10 years apart. And now it was 10 years later, it was 2020, and the thought that went through my mind was, who would they be now? So there's a character named Waldo, who is my personal favorite character, who's 11 years old when we meet him in 2010. So he'd be a college student, I thought. Where would he be going to school? What would have happened to him? How would he have grown up? I thought about Theo, who you just met in, in, in the reading that I did. Theo grows up to be a chef, and he has this fantastic tiny restaurant in Brooklyn, and he's very, very shy and introverted, and food is love for him, and feeding people is, is his, his passion. What would he be doing um, at the epicenter of the first wave of the pandemic with a restaurant in Brooklyn? All of the characters suddenly um, sprang back to life for me as if they had been asleep in that drawer for the better part of 15 years, and they had woken up. But one of the really miraculous things, too, is that I had woken up. I needed that time to deserve the characters that I had already created in that initial, in that initial burst 15 years ago. And I really feel that had I not made the, the discovery about my father, um, had I not um, come to think more deeply about something I had always thought a lot about, which is, why are we sometimes so familiar to each other? Why do we sometimes meet someone and think, I know you? you know, or like steer clear, or whatever our instincts tell us about another human, where does that come from? Is there a way in which we can glance, you know, glancingly touch each other's lives to profound effect. Um, and I really believe it, there is. I mean, that to me, that's a real personal philosophy of mine, really is that everything that we do matters. And then here I was, the product of that. You know, the random product of a medical student who had a free hour and went and don donated some sperm on his way to, you know, chemistry lab, um, and my mom. Um, and my dad, who raised me and loved me into being. Um, I was some combination of all of these pieces of all of these pinballs, all of this chaos, all of this randomness leading to my very existence. Um, and that was such a powerful, I mean, I went on such a journey that had to do with identity and, and, and what, if, what makes a family a family, what makes a father a father. Um, you know, what is, what is love? Um, what does nature and nurture have to do with it? Um, and then in the wake of Inheritance's publication, um, and I was on tour um, and speaking to huge audiences and actually really making a difference in the world with this book because there were so many people who had made similar discoveries uh, and, and or adoptees who had discovered they were adopted or men who discovered they had children that they hadn't known about. I mean, so many different kinds of, of, of stories and secrets. I was on the road and having this extraordinary time, um, and my husband was with me, and we found out that he was diagnosed with a very serious form of cancer from which he has completely recovered. But at that time, it was that feeling that we all know something about of the way that life can change in an instant, or 
as Joan Didion beautifully describes it, the ordinary instant. And then suddenly everything is different and suddenly you're in the world of the stricken, the unwell, the unlucky. And just two seconds ago, you were on the other side of that veil, but now you're on that side. I learned a great deal about that, that, inf that, that makes its way into signal fires um, in a completely, you know, in a, in a completely fictional way. But if not for my discovery about my father, if not for my husband's illness and recovery, if not for the pandemic, this book would never have come back into being. And so I really see it as this way in which there are these characters who lived, you know, in a drawer, you know, were asleep, were like characters pressed into amber in some way um, that I had given up on, let go of. Um, and the trajectory of the what I know now, the, the, the room that there was for me to grow and learn and, and accumulate the kind of knowledge um, and emotional, um, yeah, like um, emotional intelligence, I guess, that, that was poured into this book. And the last thing I'll say, because I wanna leave it open um, for conversation and questions, which is always my favorite part, um, is that here's something very strange for you. Um, we're in a sacred space. Um, so when I created the character of Ben Wilf, you only got a glimmer of him in what I read, but some of you have read the book. Um, he is a doctor. He's 78 years old. Um, his medical specialty is pulmonology. Uh, he, had, he looks a certain way, um, actually very much like Stan. He looks very much like Stan. Um, and, um, and he has a manner that's very um, kind and discerning and strong and um, um, a little held back. He doesn't say everything that he thinks, but he misses nothing, this, this guy, this character that I created, Ben Wilf. I created him six or seven years before I met the man who is my biological father. And they are the same person. And I did not even think about that or recognize that or it, it never entertained the notion when I returned to these pages. I just kept writing the book and I finished it and I gave the manuscript to my son who is in his early 20s, who's a wonderful reader and likes to, you know, I, I like to give my, my work to him in early stages. And he finished the manuscript and he came into my office and he was holding it and he said, Mom, it's him. And as soon as he said it, I thought, it is. How is that possible? What does that mean? Where do these characters come from? Um, how do we conjure them? Um, there was some way in which that person, um, who was a total stranger to me, was in fact alive within me in some way. Um, which is the way that characters always feel to writers is they, they fictional characters they they spring they spring from somewhere um, and they are at least as real as everyone else in in the author's life um, and so that for me is one of the really magical aspects of signal fires and in fact I didn't have a title for it until well after I had completed the book and the file name in my computer for this novel was and still is Magic Novel because that's what it felt like to me. So I will leave it there and I would love to um, open it up to questions. Yeah. There, there, yeah. You guys are on it. Hi. Um, speaking of uh, the doctor, I've, he was one of my favorite characters in the book. He is so kind to everyone. You know, he's he's kind to, particularly to uh, Waldo, um, and his wife who goes through Alzheimer's. Um, he he was just a great character, and I think it's very interesting that now was your 
birth father a doctor? Yes, oh. and a pulmonary surgeon. Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the only one of your main characters, Waldo's mother, um, Alice did not have her own chapter. Um, we didn't seem to hear a lot from Alice about all the events that, that we did. What was the reasoning or the choice behind that? Thanks, great question. Alice actually does have one chapter of her own. Um, she has a chapter after they're driving with Waldo back from the playhouse, after all of the events that happen in the playhouse. We are in Alice's point of view for that, for that chapter. Um, but certainly she doesn't have as many chapters as the other characters. I wasn't thinking about all, like giving all of the characters sort of equal voice. And in a way, Alice doesn't have equal voice in the book. She's very overshadowed and overpowered by her husband, Shankman. Um, we, I hope, really feel her um, profound love for, for Waldo um, and, and her concern for him and her protectiveness of him. Um, it's possible that I wanted, if I had gone further, this is the first time I'm thinking of this, but if I had gone further into Alice's point of view, um, that would have meant going further into her worries and fears about Waldo. And I didn't want to do that. You know, one, one of the things that um, I found very satisfying writing, and I hope that readers are finding satisfying in the reading experience, that moving around in time allowed me to do in Signal Fires is that, you know, when we meet Waldo, we, we, we worry for him. He's a special, brilliant, lonely boy who is out of step with the rest of the world, whose father does not understand him and is hard on him, um, and whose mother does understand him but is a little passive. And we would really be worried about Waldo, but we get glimpses of who Waldo is going to become in his life. And I think that that intervenes in our worry about him. So we get to see what it's so satisfying to see in life and you know, I think is a fantasy for so many of us, which is, could I just have a crystal ball? Like just for a second, could I just, could the window shade just go up for a minute and I could look and see that everything's indeed gonna be okay and then, all right, then I can march on. And of course we don't get to have that, but it's a very human desire. And in this structure, it allowed me to have a few moments like that where we can breathe on behalf of the characters who we feel worried about, which is why I think it's a book that's about some hard things, but that people, I, what I hear is that it makes people feel very hopeful and, and you know, hopeful about humanity. And can, oh, and I, one other thing I wanna say in that regard, which is that the way that the pandemic played into this book, aside from the fact that I rediscovered those pages and was able to create these, this sliver of 2020 in, 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 in the book, is that we were all in this time, I'm not entirely sure we're out of it, where we became aware of how deeply interdependent we all are on one another. And I had written the start of a book that was really about a neighborhood and the way that when you live in a community, you live in a neighborhood, um, you've settled down in this place with people who may or may not have a lot in common with you, but it is, they're your people. They become your people and you have an intimacy with them um, because you're witnessing each other's lives. And there was something that felt um, very powerful in terms of writing about that in the time that we've been living in where we're all in it together. When you, when the characters were awoken after many years of slumber, did you wrestle with who they were as 10 year old, ver 10 year older versions of themselves or did you know immediately who they had grown into being? Thanks, that's a great question. For the most part, I immediately knew 
um, who they had become. In the case of one character, uh, the character of Sarah, she's the one that I rethought. Um, in the initial hundred, and it wasn't that I, I, I knew what had become of her, I wanted to redraft who I had thought her to be when I first wrote those pages, because in the initial hundred pages, Sarah had all the same haunted kind of feelings and issues that she ends up having in the finished book, but she was passive in the, she was a Hollywood wife, and her husband Peter was a big deal producer. And when I returned to the pages, I just thought, and pardon my French, especially in this setting, but I thought, you know, I want Sarah to be a badass. You know, sorry. Um, I, 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 want, I want Sarah to have agency in her own self-destructive tendencies and the ability to um, turn her life around, the means to do that at, and the freedom to do that at any point and continue to choose not to until she finally makes better choices. Uh, first of all, I loved it. It was so beautiful. Um, it felt very spiritual. Um, and there was a lot that seemed like philosophical and metaphysical and we have astronomy. And, and so I was wondering if you could talk about the research you did and if you were reading philosophers um, and, and who were they? Mm, thank you. I love it when I'm working on something that insists that I uh, delve into um, research that I might not otherwise delve into. And so in the case of the character of Waldo, Waldo is um, fascinated by, obsessed with the cosmos, and he ultimately, he grows up to become a uh, famed astrophysicist and a professor of astrophysics. Um, what I needed to do in my research was keep up with Waldo at age 11, and then 14, and then as a college student, but mostly 11-year-old Waldo, and that, that I could do. Um, I did, I, I read alongside the writing. You know, one of the things that I, one of the greatest pieces of wisdom about research and writing that I've ever heard um, came from uh, E.L. Doctorow, who was a colleague and a, and a friend and I was a young writer teaching at the same university as, as, as he, and we had dinner together one night, and I was very intimidated by him, I was peppering him with questions. And you know, he, he, wrote, he wrote great historical fiction. He wrote the Book of Daniel and Ragtime, and, um, and he had just published a novel called Waterworks, and I asked him about research and how he researched, and he said, I write the novel and then I fact check my imagination. And what I love about that is like, for those of you who um, read historical fiction, sometimes you'll see a passage in there that feels a little like extra. Like why is, it, why is that there? Why, is, why do we have this digression into you know, the migration of, and I'm, I can't even make up, but why do we have this, why are we lost in this story right now that's pulling us away from the story that we were reading? And it's inevitably that the writer worked so hard to get that information, traveled to another continent, you know, spent money and time figuring out this one thing that ended up not belonging, but, you know, by Jove it was going to be in that book. And, and what Dr. O's um, way of thinking about it was made so much sense to me because the imagination really does have its own coherence. Not that it's gonna get everything right, but there's a way in which, I mean, to me, well, w Waldo's obsession with the cosmos began with an app. The app in, there's an app in, in, in signal fires called Starwalk. And it's not a made up app, it's a real app, app and it's free and if you're even slightly interested in the stars and the constellations, I highly recommend it. It's, it's poetic and the first time I saw it, I think my son at the time showed it to me, who was Waldo's age. And it will show you the, 
the outlines of the constellations in the, in the sky at any, any given moment, anywhere on the planet, and at any moment in history. And my initial research into Waldo really was, it, it began with that app, because that's what Waldo was looking at. And I didn't, I didn't ever get too far ahead of him. You were talking about the characters, and I think to some degree, all of the characters are checked out in some way, shape, or form. But to me, the most checked out person was Shankman. Could you talk about him a little bit? Sure. I love Shankman. Everybody's, everybody's most trou trou troubled and troubling character. Um, so Shankman, Waldo's dad, is so insecure his worldview is really, all he wants is for Waldo to be quote unquote normal. Because in his mind, that is a prescription for a happier and more contented life than being special or different. Um, so he can't embrace or understand his son's uniqueness. You know, he's, he's the dad standing at the sidelines of the little league game who's just, sort of dying of shame and embarrassment that his kid is out there staring at his shoelaces or staring up at the sky while you know the ball whizzes by and another kid catches it. And the way that that emerges for Shankman is he, he becomes enraged with his son. He really doesn't know how to be a father to him. And the feeling that I had about all of these characters the entire time I was writing this book was I felt like I couldn't control what they did um, every time Shankman did something like that, I as the writer, um, or maybe a bit as the omniscient narrator, would just think to myself, oh Shankman, could you just get out of your own way? I wish you could get out of your own way. And, and he's the most tragic figure in a lot of ways because in the end he realizes that he has not done a good job at the one thing in life that if you don't, you know, if you don't do a good job of it, you don't get a do-over and he has that awareness. So he is both profoundly unself-aware, but aware of his flaws. He's aware of his flaws, but he can't do anything to fix them, um, which struck me as really tragic. Hi. Hi. Um, this is a possibly odd question, but uh, one thing as uh, someone with Jewish heritage myself as well, um, something that struck me about the book is that they were Jewish and it just kind of was a casual part of their identity. It was introduced through references of words, not as a major focus of who they are or the family culture. It was just, this is a Jewish family. And especially, I think, as the setting was this idea of like an all-American neighborhood, that's something that could work against people understanding this neighborhood is just an all-American neighborhood. Obviously, we're not a large percentage of the American population. So I'm just interested in that choice and if it was one with meaning, more meaning behind it or it just is because you have Jewish heritage and mm. you wrote them as Jewish. That's a great observation. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I've written other books that are much more overtly Jewish. And... Signal Fire is actually just won the biggest award there is in the Jewish community. It won the National Jewish Book Award. And I was, and, and so did Inheritance, my memoir. So I've, I've, I've won that award twice, which is incredibly meaningful to me. I wanted there to be a sense of Jewish assimilation. And, you know, the idea and I guess in a way it was its own stealth political statement for me. Like what does it mean for a book to be a Jewish book? Does it have to have a rabbi as a main character? You know, do they have to keep kosher? Um, what, what, what does it mean to, like what does it mean to write an Italian book? What does it mean to write a, I mean, what, what, what do these, you know, what, what do these things mean? Um, and as someone who has written, particularly my memoir Devotion, which is about a spiritual search and so therefore really delves into my childhood and, and is a deeply um, Jewish book. 
these characters are living their lives in suburban East Coast bedroom community of New York City, America. And they go to bar mitzvahs and they have Jewish last names and they have memories of, they go, they go to synagogue maybe on Yom Kippur. There's the occasional Yiddish word, which is actually the way a great number of, 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 of Jewish people live. And I wanted to not point to that, but to just have it be um, embedded in the fabric of this world. That's what, that's what, that, that, that's who the Wilfs and the Schenkmans are in this world. I think we have one, one last question. Who do you read? Who do I read? I reread. Um, I could start with who I reread. Um, I, I go, I reread Mrs. Dalloway just about every year. Um, Wallace Stegner. Um, Crossing to Safety is a book that I go back to and reread. Um, contemporary writers, I mean, there's so many that I, I, I love and admire. Oh, actually, my, my husband and son and I, on New Year's Day, started a three-person book club, and we're reading um, Swan's Way, the Proust. And I highly recommend taking a really challenging, difficult book and reading it with a couple of people 10 pages at a time. It's so satisfying. Um, it feels like eating, you know, one bite of the best dessert you could imagine and knowing you're going to get another bite the next day and another bite the next day. And it somehow becomes not completely daunting the way it can be with, with, um, with you know, in search um, of lost time. Um, contemporary writers, oh, I, where do I even begin? Um, Jennifer Egan, Laurie Moore, um, Ian McEwen, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the, the question always stumps me because I'm always reading and my answer changes depending on who I'm reading, what I've recently read. Um, but I, I tend to read away from what it is that I'm working on. So if I'm working on something and there are writers out there who I feel are, are in a similar seam or a similar vein, I stay away from those writers. You know, when I, I wrote a book, a novel with a... Um, a male narrator, 64-year-old male psychoanalyst, Holocaust survivor. Um, I didn't read a word of Bellow or Roth or, you know, I, I stayed away from writers who I thought would in some way either influence me or intimidate me. Um, and um, so I tend when I'm writing to gravitate toward the opposite, the other, and I read a lot of poetry. Thank you. Thank you.